is sponsored by Lake Champlain Sea Grants Education Program, known as Watershed Alliance, with support from UVM Extension and SUNY Plattsburgh. Lake Champlain Sea Grant develops and shares science-based knowledge to benefit the environment and economies of the Lake Champlain Basin. Watershed Alliance is a Lake Champlain Sea Grant education program that aims to reach K-12 students and their teachers throughout the Lake Champlain Basin. Our goal is to increase awareness and knowledge of watershed issues in youth throughout Vermont and New York. The Zoom a Scientist series was created in response to the current need for more virtual programs. Every Tuesday and Friday from now until the end of June, we'll be hosting a guest scientist to tell us more about their research in the Lake Champlain Basin. Uh, just as a heads up, this webinar is currently being live streamed to our Lake Champlain Sea Grant YouTube channel as uh, another avenue for teachers and students to engage in these presentations. And they will also be archived on our YouTube channel shortly after the presentation so folks can revisit and share this webinar with folks who might have missed it. So without Further ado, uh, let me introduce today's presenter, Dr. Eric Leibensberger, as an associate professor in the Center for Earth and Environmental Science at SUNY Plattsburgh. Eric studies the physical and chemical aspects of our environment, including physical limnology and atmospheric science. Eric enjoys working with undergraduate research students and playing the ukulele to his two-year-old daughter. She mostly tolerates it. So the title of Eric's talk today is Climate Change in the Lake Champlain Basin. What's already happened and where we're headed? Climate change is here. We often think about climate change as a distant consequence of today's actions, but we are already experiencing the impacts. This discussion will highlight changes that we have already observed and that are projected to occur in the future within the Champlain Valley. And with that, I'm going to turn today's session over to Eric Leibensberger. Eric, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks, Nate. And let me, uh, let me share my presentation. How's that looking? Good? Yep, that's great. Thanks, Eric. Okay. All right. Well, thanks, everybody, for tuning in today. I have to say, it's actually even more intimidating to present to people who you can't see rather than being in front of a large audience. And last I saw it, there was over 70 people tuning in today, which is just fantastic. And I really appreciate everybody um, coming in and, and uh, uh, listening today. So I'm Eric Leibensberger, as, as uh, Nate said, and I'm a professor at SUNY Plattsburgh. And um, for the last few years now, I've been really fortunate to have worked with a great team of scientists, including a number of, of, uh, of students. And so here's some, some um, folks who have really helped out a lot on this project and, and the numbers kind of show where where they are uh, around the basin. Uh, but everybody in here who's a, who has their name italicized is an undergraduate student who worked on this project. And I'm really proud um, to have included them on this. And they really um, you know, did, a, did a fantastic job uh, um, working on this. And you know, what I'm sharing with you right now is a lot of things that um, these students really kind of uh, um, put a lot of effort and time into. Um, and uh, so on, on the right here, you can see our, uh, one of our data buoys, uh, which is out in the lake. And uh, we'll talk more about this in a minute, but a lot of what I'm gonna talk to you about today has been supported by Lake Champlain Sea Grant. And uh, we've been really fortunate to be able to um, kind of do some research on climate change in the Champlain Basin, but also having great avenues like this one um, that Sea Grant allows us to, uh, that, that uh, uh, creates, that allows us to kind of build a, a bridge um, to the community, which is just a, a fantastic um, thing. Uh, so first, um, you know, as, as Nate said, kind of in the intro, climate change is here. Um, this is, you know, uh, I, I would argue the most important graph there is out there right now. And what this graph is showing is um, uh, uh, our temperature of our Earth. And so on the top right here, you can see our planet. And you can imagine sticking a thermometer all around the, the planet and trying to figure out what its temperature is. Um, that's what this record is, is basically doing, is taking all of the uh, temperature records that we have from people's, uh, um, from all of the uh, weather service uh, observatories around the United States, uh, around North America, around our hemisphere, around our globe. And so putting them all together, compiling them all together to figure out what the temperature is of our planet. And what we've been able to observe is that our temperature is increasing. 
and our temperature is increasing um, compared to the end of the last uh, of the 19th century. And that increase is about a degree Celsius. And that might sound like a real um, a small number. So a degree um, doesn't sound like a lot, but I argue that uh, anybody who's had a parent uh, like I had, who is very uh, picky about the temperature in your house, if you bump that thermostat up just one degree Fahrenheit, they're gonna know it and they're gonna find you and they're gonna yell at you for doing that. But the planet is also sensitive in this way too. And so we've had a degree Celsius warm. Again, it sounds small, uh, but as we'll see in a second, there's been some really large impacts. So uh, on the bottom right here, you can see that this is the five warmest years on record are basically the last uh, five years. And the forecasts, uh, as of now at least, is that 2020 will be the largest or the, the warmest uh, year on our observational record. Um, and all these lines, by the way, all the colors are just different uh, research groups who compile data in different manners and analyze it in different ways, but you can see the results are basically the same. So we talk about warming, right? Global warming, climate change, we use those words a lot, but it's a lot more than just the temperature changing, right? It's a lot more than just your parents being able to tell that, that you move the thermostat. Um, it's impacting people, as we'll see in a second, and it's also impacting ecosystems or, or living things. And so um, this is a graph from the National Climate Assessment that I really like. Um, it's showing uh, basically where um, kind of the, the center of, of some fisheries were of, of three different types of fish. So you can see the American lobster, I guess American lobster on a fish, but of uh, uh, ocean creatures. So we have the American lobster, uh, we have the red hake and the black sea bass. And each one of these dots is kind of a time period or an observation of where those species were. And the shading tells you the different years. And so the lighter the colors is long ago. That's on the average about 50 years ago. Um, the darker colors are more closely like today. So 2015, so a little dated, but uh, mostly up until today. And what we've been able to uh, observe is that these things are changing, right? And so these species are moving from the south to the north. And one of the reasons why is because they're looking for their particular temperature, the temperature that they like, the temperature that uh, allows them um, to thrive and uh, exist. And so they're moving to find that. And as our temperatures warm, they need to go where it's colder. And so it's colder as you go farther north, and that's what they're looking for. So also there's devastation you know, around the world from, from our, 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 our warming. So this is a, a, an image of the bushfire in Australia from January 2020. Um, this, this bushfire basically happened because uh, for the continent of Australia, it was the driest year on record and also the warmest year on record. Um, those two things sometimes go hand in hand. Um, and so there's at least some uh, climate impact or that made this a little bit worse than it would have been otherwise. And so you can see the trees burning here. And these images, um, I find them really striking. So on the left, this is a, you know, uh, uh, Kangaroo Islands. Um, you can guess where the names come from, but this is Kangaroo Islands. And this is uh, the satellite image from January 12th, 2020. And so you can see all of this kind of, uh, kind of grayish black area over here, which is area that has burned. And over here, this is just a month before that in December of 2019, you can see how lush and green it was. And this isn't a change of season. This isn't you know, the leaves being lost. This is the area that's being burned. Um, and so significant areas across the entire continent have burned um, with large consequences on, um, for ecosystems, but also for people. So here, uh, this is the South uh, east coast of uh, Australia, you can see the, the plumes of smoke and ash um, coming off of the fires. Um, and again, this is just one type of impact that we see um, from climate change. And to bring it back, kind of back to people, um, one of the things that we're really worried about about climate change is that it's not just a, a science problem, it's not just a problem for ecosystems, it's a problem for people. But who is impacted the most um, tends to be people who have the least ability to adapt. So the people who um, don't have the financial means, so they don't have a lot of money. And so within the United States, but also certainly around the world, um, people who are kind of you know, scraping to get by are going to be the people who are gonna be the most greatly impacted. And that's because they tend to live in places that are already fragile and uh, have a difficult, difficult time um, and don't have that kind of um, 
you know, that, that financial um, stability that will allow them to keep um, stable. You know, if you think about um, someone who's extraordinarily wealthy and they have maybe like a, a house on the ocean, you know, they might be able to build a seawall to protect their house, but somebody who, you know, does not have that financial means will lose what they have. And so when we talk about climate change, we're talking about these things, not only in terms of ecosystems, but also in terms of people. But again, I just want to plug that there, that this is not going to be just, uh, you know, everyone gets impacted the same. It, ten it tends to be the people who can deal with it the least, uh, financially at least, who are able to, or who are impacted the most. All right, that was kind of a global picture. And I wanted to set the global picture because I think it's really important. And I wanted to use some time for that to show that, you know, warming uh, impacts things other than just the temperature, right? And I want to also now zoom in on the Lake Champlain Basin. And so for the global temperature, you might remember I said that uh, we took the, the temperature records from all the stations that we had around the, the Earth and create a master temperature for the entire planet. Well, my students have been doing the same thing, but zeroing in instead on the Lake Champlain Basin. And so the temperature stations that we have uh, around the, the, the region. And this is on the order right now of um, you know, the, the long-term records going back into the late 19th century. If you look at all the different sites that we can analyze, it's around 30 sites. And if you compile them all together, the picture is pretty clear that the Champlain Basin has also been warming, just like the globe has, is, is, is warming. But if you notice the scale is even larger than it was for even larger than it was for um, the globe. And so it's about 1.8 degrees uh, Celsius warming compared to the globe. One thing you might notice though, is that when we look at somewhere so small, like, uh, like the Champlain Basin, or we focus on like New York State or Vermont, um, or even just New England in its entirety, um, the variation, the up and down really increases a lot. And so, you know, the, the change from it being a warm year to being a cold year can be very large uh, compared to looking on maybe like the US scale or the hemisphere scale. And so one thing that we notice when we look at the Champlain Basin is that the up and down really is quite large. And one thing that, we, that we're starting to analyze now is that up and down has really been kind of large the last few years. And if you think about this kind of, you know, the back of your mind a little bit, it's, it, you might kind of have some memories of this too. So for example, winter, the winter we just came through um, was one of the most um, uh, important or warmest winters that we've, that we've experienced in a very long time in the, in the North Country, New York and in Vermont. Um, but just a few years ago, you might remember there were some really terribly cold years. And so there's been these big fluctuations, which over the last few years kind of has made things a little bit more um, uh, interesting to study because the, the, the impacts are not quite as clear as they were if we kind of looked even just you know five years ago when things were a little bit more steady. We'll, and we'll talk a little bit about, more about that. All right, so um, if we think about Lake Champlain Basin, there's a couple of things that might kind of come up in your mind. Um, so the top left here, these are all images that I, that I um, was able to retrieve from the internet. Um, so you can see the, the credits there. So the, the top left there is the, the flooding of one of the ferry uh, landings. Um, and the bottom left there, a picture of a kind of an algae bloom, with what's called the Secchi disk uh, going down. Secchi disks help us figure out how uh, clear the water is. And obviously that water is not very clear. Um, and on the top right, you can see some anglers after a fishing tournament with their, they're so proud of their, their catch there. And then the bottom right, you can see uh, some, a large group of folks uh, ice fishing. That actually was an ice fishing um, a festival. Uh, and you can see all these things, you know, are, are maybe what you think about in terms of uh, climate change and, and, and all these things are going to be impacted. And, you know, those things that we think about when we think about Lake Champlain are going to be impacted. And so you can think about, for example, you know, water quality. You might think about like, like you know, are the fish getting enough oxygen and nutrients and all of that? And yes, they usually are. Um, but those types of things are also related to what's happening with the biology of the lake, all the organisms that are there. And that influences us, right? Because we eat some of the fish or we go swimming in the lake or we, we, we use it for recreation. But also there's physical aspects of the lake too that are important, like the temperature, how hot or cold is the water, um, how big are the waves, so the hydrology, how big are the waves, um, how hot, what is the flood stage, uh, the currents are important, ice cover. 
all of these things are really important and they're currently being stressed or impacted by things that are outside of nature and kind of put on by us, by humans. And so the physical things are being really stressed by climate change what we're talking about today. Uh, the chemical aspects, you know, water quality is being impacted by contaminants and pollutants. And then also we have invasive species that are coming in. And I just wanna say, you know, one thing, you know, we talk about the impacts of climate change at Lake Champlain. Lake Champlain is not just experiencing one stress, one thing causing it to change or to have to be resilient against. It's being, it's having to re be resilient against all of these things together. And even some of these things work together, um, which we'll see in a second. All right, so if we want to look at what's happening in the lake, how do we do that? Well, uh, Lake Champlain is extraordinarily fortunate because there has been a long-term monitoring program called the Lake Champlain Long-Term Monitoring Program um, that's been going on now for over three decades. And it's a joint program uh, by the Lake Champlain Basin Program, the EPA, uh, and the New York State and Vermont uh, DECs. And uh, what these folks do is they go out and they measure uh, the, the, the chemistry and the biology and the, and the physical parameters all around the lake. And they try to figure out you know, how, how's the lake doing. And so this informs uh, policymakers, it informs researchers, um, and it's a great tool. On the right there, you can see all the different sites that they visit, all the dots are somewhere where they visit, um, typically about once every two weeks or so. Um, the red, or the, not the red, the uh, square, the gray squares um, are some rivers or tributaries that they visit um, as well. Um, so they go there as much as they can, but they only can go there so often, okay? And they only go there typically uh, about once every two weeks or so, um, which gets us into real, real quandary here is what they're observing really weather or is it climate? Um, so there's a difference between weather and climate. Weather is kind of like an instantaneous thing. It's like what it is outside right now. So before I got here, I was uh, out with my, my two-year-old toddler and it was snowing, got all in our hair. So like that's kind of you know, the weather. It's what's happening right now. Whereas climate is kind of built over decades of statistics, lots of observations, and it's kind of the average of weather. And so the, the phrase, the common phrase is that the um, the common phrase is that the um, climate is what you expect and weather is what you get. And I love this video. Um, this is not my video. This is a YouTube find. But the description of this that I love is that this is this person here is walking their dog, and in this kind of analogy here, the person is the climate. It's what you expect, right? You expect you expect somebody walking their dog on the sidewalk to walk kind of straight. And the dogs are going to kind of go all over the place. But as the dogs going all over the place, its general path is kind of in the direction that the person's moving, right? So this person, as they're moving from, um, you know, from our left to, to the right here, you can see, you can predict where they're going to be. But the dog, you know, at any given moment, eventually will be somewhere around up here, but you don't know if they'll be up here or down here. And so weather kind of is like what the dog is like, and climate is more what the person is, right? It's kind of more slow and steady and average thing. And so when our researchers go out and they make their um, measurements, you know, the question is, is, are they measuring kind of the weather or are they measuring the climate, the average? And so um, in order to kind of figure some of this out, um, Lake Champlain Sea Grant has been extraordinarily generous in um, supporting um, some data buoys that SUNY Plattsburgh has put out uh, across the lake. And these data buoys measure a whole bunch of different things. They measure, measure um, kind of the weather parameters like air temperature and wind speed and all those things kind of at the top. And I'm extraordinarily proud of this graphic that I made in, in PowerPoint. Um, here's what it look, really looks like over here. Um, and then it also measures the temperature of the water from the surface all the way down to the bottom. And you can see that we have two spots that we measure here off of Valcor Island, and then also uh, down here in the southern part, what we call the South Main Lake. And all of this data is available in near real time. And so if you ever have a need for it, if you're like the fish or you just wanna know what's going on in the lake, you can go to this website right here. And this website will have, when it's deployed, uh, near real time uh, information. We're still trying to figure out whether or not we're able even to put it out this year because 
uh, New York State and Vermont both have kind of a, a pause going on. And so all the boat launches are closed and we're not really allowed to be working uh, in close quarters. And so we're trying to figure out what uh, we're able to do. So maybe not this summer, uh, but generally it's going to uh, be there. And so this is a graph that shows kind of the type of data that you get. So here's the two sites, so near Valcor Island and South Main Lake. And this is the temperature. So this is the depth. So this is the surface up here at the top. And then at the bottom, this is as deep as we go, about 50 meters, uh, which is about like 100, um, 165 feet. And so our temperature go down. And as we'll see in a second, we can see the layering of these different uh, sections here. And we'll see that in a second. All right, so to, to kind of make a, a long story short, um, the buoy observations have told us that we can use um, those long-term monitoring databases. So those things where they go out every two weeks and make measurements to better understand what's happening with the climate. And when we do that, we see kind of, uh, kind of graphs that look like this, which is, this is one site called Site 19, which is out in the middle of the lake, kind of west of Burlington. Uh, and the, you can see the temperatures going up and up and up in August and in the summertime. And so our temperatures are warming and they're actually warming at a pretty fast rate, um, which is a bit um, alarming. I'm gonna skip through that real quick. And so, all right, so um, let's do a poll. So we know that the climate of the lake, uh, Lake Champlain Basin is warming. And is it because A, Joe Exotic said so? Is it B, because of the exceptionally warm 2019, 2022 winter season? Is it C, because of decades long observational program conducted by the states of New York and Vermont? Or is it that the White Walkers were defeated in the Game of Thrones? Great, so it looks like a lot of you are, uh, go ahead and answering that question. Again, if the polling feature isn't working for you for some reason, go ahead and just type your answer into the chat box. Um, but get those answers in. We'll just give you like 10 more seconds and then uh, we'll share the results of the poll. All right, there it is. Go ahead, Eric. Talk us through those results. All right. Well, nobody, nobody said that because Joe, Joe Exotic told us so. That's probably a good, a good thing. Uh, nor that the White Walkers were defeated. Um, uh, but we have a split here. So 85% say C, which is that we have decades-long observational program conducted by New York and Vermont. And we also have B, which is 15% saying B, which is the exceptionally warm 2019-2020 winter season. Um, and the correct answer is C. And uh, this is a very, very, very common um, kind of source of confusion, which is that if you remember, uh, this is one of the things is the difference between winter and, um, uh, excuse me, between, between weather and climate. And weather is kind of a, a one year thing or a um, kind of an instantaneous thing outside. Whereas for climate, we really need to have lots of observations. And so we've been extraordinarily fortunate in our basin here that we've had them. Not all um, um, regions can kind of can say um, the same thing. So we're really fortunate. All right, thanks, Nate. All right, so and the last little bit here, I wanna talk about a second thing that we're doing thanks to the support of, of, of Sea Grant, uh, which is looking at the impact of weather. And so you might think, well, wait a second, you talked about climate, why are you talking about weather? Well, these things are actually, they're related. Um, and one of the things that we're, that we're experiencing is that climate can influence the likelihood or the chances that certain weather events can occur. And what we're studying now, and this is kind of like cutting edge, you know, my students are working on this right now. What we're studying right now is whether or not the events that we see that are important for the biology and the chemistry of the lake and the physics of the lake are changing. And that's basically due to large storms. And large storms typically come through Lake Champlain. And you know, Lake Champlain is very long and narrow. It's kind of like a long popsicle stick. And the uh, wind very commonly comes from the south, south wind like this. And this kind of is, this graph is kind of showing you what that causes, which is that that wind pushes the water near the surface towards the top. And so at the very top part of the lake, we have an area called the Epilimnion, which we'll see again in a second. 
And in the bottom part of the lake, we have an area called the hypolimnion. The epilimnion near the top, and I always remember this as ep being like up, so it's like the upper part. Epilimnion is where it's really warm. And the hypolimnion is where it's very cold. And if you've ever swam in a lake in the middle of summer and you've kind of done like a cannonball or you've gone through the epilimnion down in the hypolimnion, you'll know there's a very sharp contrast where there's a very hot temperature or not hot, but warm temperatures near the surface and then cooler, cold temperatures down at the bottom. And what we're looking at is when the wind occurs, all that warm water gets pushed to one side, typically the north side of the lake, and that colder water comes up to the surface. And what does that do? What does that do to our, 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 um, our, our chemistry of the, of the lake? What does that do to the biology of the lake? And is the, the frequency of that changing? So real quickly to show you a little video from our data buoys, um, this is showing on the bottom, the temperature. So up here, this is the epilimnion and this is the hypolimnion and this is stepping through time. And so here, this is the wind, so it got windy. And you'll notice that the water down there got warmer and the water up here got colder as everything was mixing around as that, as that uh, wind came through. And then eventually it resets where the cold water is on the bottom and the warm water is back up on the top. And so this is one of the things that we're studying and trying to understand what the impacts of these events are. And so to do this, um, Tom Manley from Middlebury College and I um, have six different uh, moorings or data buoys down in the southern part of the lake. So split rocks right here. Uh, so you can see kind of work for example where we are. Here's the Champlain Bridge. Um, and what we're doing is we're, we're measuring uh, the temperatures from the top to the bottom. We're also doing periodic measurements of the biology and the chemistry at those sites to understand what's happening. And then we're also measuring um, the currents or how fast the wind, the, the wind, how fast the um, uh, uh, water uh, currents are going in the lake in those spots. If we compile all of those records of the temperature, you get kind of graphs that look like this. So on the top, that's Valcor Island. On the bottom, that's our South Main Lake. This on the, along this here is the different times. And then the up and down is how deep you are. So this is the surface at the top. And this is the surface at the top of the two different sites, right? And going over time and the colors show us the different temperatures. So the darker the red, that's a hotter temperature and the more blue, the colder the temperature. And so you can see this kind of like seesaw, right? Up and down, up and down, up and down. Each one of these is those wind events that we talked about where we have kind of cooling of the, of the water at the top and warming of the water at the, at the bottom. And the south southern site kind of has the same thing where we can see some cooling events at the bottom and some warming events at the top. And so what we're trying to do is understand how do these influence chemistry and can we predict them? Can we figure out if climate will influence them? And so um, the dashed lines that you see are all times that we went down and made measurements, some, some chemistry and, and biology measurements. And I wanna show one quick slide here about this, which is showing kind of how much uh, of um, a, a zooplankton there are in the uh, water column. So kind of a, a, a diagnostic or a measurement of how much biology is going on. And there's three different types that we've been looking at. You can see them here. And so the copepods, the uh, clodocera and the uh, rotifers. And you can see that these are all different times that we went out and made measurements. And this is showing, you know, good old bar chart, how many we're measuring for each visit. And I want you to analyze or look at these two in particular. So these two in particular, you'll notice that this kind of middle gray color, so it's not, not black, it's not light gray, it's kind of middle gray, um, is higher in each of these, right? And in each of these, we also see a total number, if you added up all of these bars and put them all on top of each other, to add up, there's a lot more biology going on and a lot more rotifers. And those rotifers come from uh, the cold water. And so what we're seeing is that when we go out, like on the 8th, like we saw right here, and on the 20th, 
we're actually seeing completely different biology than what we see when we go out on the days that aren't windy. And so what are, we're doing now, and we're still kind of working on this, this is all brand new to us, is we're kind of comparing the difference between these kind of like non-stormy days and these stormy days to better understand what's happening and then assess whether or not climate change is causing us or will cause these things to alter even further. All right, um, that was a lot. I think I'm a little long, uh, but I will ask the second question here. So weather impacts uh, Lake Champlain ecosystems by A, creating currents that influence the distribution of heat, chemicals, and organisms. B, preventing anglers from storming the lake to fish. C, providing uh, midichlorians through rainfall, a necessary component of lake force. Or D, depositing sharks via the passage of a shark NATO. That's great. Yeah, it looks like tons of people are answering the poll right now. Uh, just give you maybe 10, 15 more seconds to go ahead and choose the best answer. Uh, if you're not seeing that poll pop up on your screen, again, you can feel free to type your answer in the chat box. So maybe just a couple more seconds and then we'll share the results. All right, Eric, take it away. All right, so it looks like ev most everyone um, chose A, creating currents that influence the distribution of chemicals or heat chemicals and organisms. That's correct. And that's what we're studying right now. Um, one person chose C, which is providing midichlorians through rainfall, necessary component of lake force. So midichlorians is actually the um, microscopic entity that lives inside of people in the Star Wars universe. And so you can see Ray and uh, uh, Kylo Ren there um, fighting over a lightsaber. Um, and of course, Sharknado is not real. In my classes, I've been using Sharknado as an example of bad movie science for eight years. And I was, I've been surprised that now we're up to Sharknado 6. Anyway, um, so with that, uh, I want to say thanks. Um, if you have any questions, we can chat now as, as Nate will chime in here in a second, but also my email address is up there. Please feel free at any time that you'd like to reach out. Always happy to, um, uh, to communicate with people who want to learn more. Awesome. Uh, thanks so much, Eric. That was great. Um, really informative and, and well done. Um, so before we jump into question and answer, I just want to uh, let everyone know that we have some feedback polls to come and a take home activity. So please stick around with us if you have the time until the end of the question and answer session. And then uh, we have some take home activities and some feedback polls for you all to fill out. Um, I'm gonna get it started with just a quick question um, off the bat, Eric. If you could think back to maybe like your college years or even your high school years or earlier when you first started getting interested in climate science, um, if you wanna maybe talk through sort of that path that you took uh, to where you are now and kind of what first sparked your interest in uh, climate science and, and limnology. Sure, yeah. So um, it's an interesting question. So I think a lot of people, not everyone, but a lot of people um, get into kind of environmental science or climate science um, by interacting with like friends and relatives outside that have experiences outside. Um, I always like to joke that, so I'm not, I am not an angler. Uh, I, I don't fish. I like to joke the last time I fished, I caught my grandfather because when I was casting, it got caught in his cheek. And that was the last time that I, <laughs> I went fishing. And that was probably you know 20 years ago by now. Um, but what really got me into it um, is, was kind of just seeing how important everything is, right? And so, um, I went to college and I studied uh, chemistry and physics at, at Ithaca College. Um, and I was, you know, the, the stereotypical, um, you know, just curious about everything. And so I never could really commit to anything, which is why I, I double majored. And then I went and, um, you know, started learning more about some of the events that were happening. Hurricane Katrina 
went through when I was um, um, right up right as I was like starting grad school. Um, and those things really kind of trigger these kind of these, these events about you know, kind of wake you up uh, events. And I think one of the great things about limnology or environmental science, um, climate science, is that you get to use, um, you kind of get to merge what you're interested in um, with a job. And it's always the best, you know, that's the best recipe that anybody can have. It's not always easy, but it's, it's what, you know, is, is great. So for example, you know, when I, when I'm teaching or when I'm doing research, it doesn't really feel like work to me because it's what I enjoy to do. And I feel extraordinarily, extraordinarily um, um, thankful um, that I'm able to do this. And so I think, you know, in terms of, of, of getting here, it's been, you know, being, being an outdoors kid, you know, I, I didn't go, I didn't fish when I was a kid, but I went hunting a lot as a kid. Um, I, you know, we go hiking a lot. I, I still try to get out hiking when I can. Um, and so I think those things really motivated me. And then I saw it as a way to uh, connect kind of the natural environment things that I like, but also I was also kind of, um, you know, math science geared and it enabled me to kind of bring those two things together. So that's, a, that's a rambling answer for you, Nate. No, that's, that's great, Eric. I think there's definitely something to be said in, in your answer for sort of following your passions and just following your interests uh, and, and letting that lead the way. So I, I appreciate that. Um, there is a question here from Mara. Uh, is the impact that comes with global warming and climate change different in different parts of the world? And if so, uh, can you talk a little bit about the differences in those impacts, depending on what region of the world you're in? Yeah, so the, the, that's a, it's a great question. And it's one of the questions that um, makes actually dealing with climate change a little bit more difficult than it would be otherwise, because not everybody will be as impacted as greatly as, as others. And so, for example, if you're living in, a, in the South Pacific where the sea level is rising and you live in an island, um, you know, it, it's, it's conceivable that your entire island will be gone and there are, you know, climate refugees looking for places to live right now um, because their island is, is, is going away, you know, that's a real, you know, impact. Whereas when we look at some other places, you know, the, the U.S. is going to have some particularly um, strong impacts of climate change, but compared to some other places, it's not as bad. And so it's, it's still bad, but not the worst. And so, it can be make it difficult to persuade people to act if the thing, the impacts that they're experiencing are not as great as what other, others are experiencing. And so I also talking about other places around the world, uh, climate change right now um, is happening the most rapidly at the, the poles, in particular the North Pole. Um, you know, the, the, the polar bear is the poster bear for, the, for climate change for a reason. Um, that's because you know their habitat is very quickly going away. Um, sea ice um, will probably not be around much in the summer, um, you know, in 50 years or so. Uh, whereas now it's already at a small fraction of what it used to be. And so these impacts are definitely different. Um, and one of the things that we tend to think about uh, with climate change and like impacts is that places that are wet, so places that get lots of rain. Um, are going to get wetter. And places that are dry, like deserts, are going to be even drier than they are now. And so it's kind of those extremes that really push things and make kind of climate change um, difficult. And this is why, again, the messaging can be difficult because the impacts differ depending on where you are. And so some people might say, well, I thought you said flooding was going to increase, but you're, you're now you're saying drought's going to increase. But it differs depending on where you are. It's a great question. Yeah, complex complex it is to study climate science, right? And it is. depending on where you are or, or what region you're studying, uh, it, it, gets, it gets quite interesting. That's why it takes a, takes a village, as they say, or a world uh, in yeah. this case. So appreciate that. Um, there's a question here from Sandy about ground temperature. Um, and I'm wondering if you know of anyone who's studying uh, the changes in ground temperature. So maybe that's like earlier thaws, uh, you know, later freezes. Is there any of that going on in the Champlain Valley? I'm not aware of, of anything uh, here locally, but I don't know. If maybe you are. I don't. I don't know of anybody doing that, but that doesn't mean that somebody isn't doing it. Um, 
there's a lot of people um, studying climate for good reason, um, you know, in, in, on the New York and Vermont sides and, and Quebec too. Um, I don't know anyone doing that, but um, it's actually, a, I, think, I think it's a very important question. I've been thinking about it a lot as somebody who has, um, you know, who, who has a, a, a sump pump in my, <laughs> in my basement. You know, I hear it turn on um, and I hear it turn off. And in the middle of winter, I'm kind of thinking, well, I'm surprised that it's, that it's, um, that it's on right now. It's not like, for example, this winter, we did not have a very deep freeze in, in the soils. And so that'll have an impact about whether or not, you know, groundwater, superficial water is moving around um, and how it impacts people's homes and how it impacts, um, uh, you know, stability of the, of the roadways and, and freeze thaw cycles and all of that. Um, so I don't know anybody who's doing that, but again, it doesn't mean that some, that there isn't anybody doing it. I just, I'm just not aware. Yeah, totally appreciate that. Uh, you know, it's a, someone's going to watch this webinar and, and launch a multi-year uh, study, right? In the Champlain. Yeah. yeah. Hopefully. Go, so. go uh, get your Nobel prize. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um, there's a question here from Laura. Uh, why are lake water temperatures rising more quickly than local air temperatures? And if you want to speak or speculate on that a little bit. Yeah, that's a great question too. So we, um, so kind of to, to back it up for a second, in general, we expect that water temperatures would increase more slowly than air temperatures, okay? And the reason for that is because water um, requires a lot of energy for its temperature to change. You need to give it a lot of energy for its temperature to go up or take a lot of energy out of it in order to make its temperature go down. Um, this is why like when you go to the, the beach um, in, the, in the summertime, the sand will be like bristling hot and it'll make your feet kind of get, get blisters on the bottom and burn your feet, but the water will still feel cold, right? Um, and so you'd expect that as things are warming, you would think that maybe the water would be a little bit more sluggish. Um, and so there's two things that I can think of about why that might happen, why, why the lake water actually is the opposite of that is happening where the lake water seems to be getting warmer than the air, more quickly than the, the air. The first is the loss of, of ice cover. So um, unfortunately we have some good, but not great records of ice cover in the Champlain, Lake Champlain. Um, some of the earlier records um, before, you know, before we had satellites um, were from people taking off from the airport in Burlington and looking out the window. The pilot happened to look out the window and the pilot happened to think there wasn't, there was ice or there wasn't ice. And they happened to radio it down to the, um, uh, to the control tower. And that person happened to record it and share it with National Weather Service, right? That's kind of how our records were, um, you know, in the, in the pre-satellite era before the 1970s, late 70s. Um, so we don't really know that, and we don't even really know much about how thick the ice is. And both of those things, how much ice there is, is really important because that determines how much energy needs to be used to melt that ice. If you think about um, you know, a, a cup of water sitting outside in the sun, it'll get warmer, but if you put some ice in there, it will get warmer more slowly. Um, because the ice, some of the energy that would be used to warm the water instead melts the ice. And so that's one, 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 one reason why. Um, another reason why um, that we're still exploring could be the changes in, in these storm, freak, storm events and, uh, and winds. If that were to happen, that might make um, kind of the top and the bottom of the lake um, separate from each other a little bit longer. And so you might, have, might remember in a little movie uh, the epilimnion, the top part of the, of, the, of the lake, got a little bit colder when the storm came through. Well, if that storm didn't come through, it would have stayed warmer and it would have potentially gotten even hotter. And so this is one of the things that we're, that we're thinking about right now. Um, uh, don't really have any way to, to, to prove those things right now, but those, those are kind of our best ideas. That's another great question. Everyone awesome. has great questions. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, Eric. And uh, you actually tied in uh, someone else's question. Mark uh, remembers driving out on the lake what seemed like every winter uh, back in the 50s, and now seems like uh, freezing over completely much much less frequently. So maybe he has some anecdotal data to contribute to that uh, 
somewhat iffy data pool that does seem to back up um, from what I've seen. Uh, definitely freezing over less 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 frequently uh, now than it was in the, in the 50s and, and even before then. Um, for the I, I've heard stories of people cross country skiing from uh, Port Kent to Burlington. Right, totally. Um, we'll do that so today. one more quick question before we move on. There's a lot of really good questions. I hate to cut it off, but um, if you could just maybe speak to this uh, for, a, for a minute before we move on. Uh, Margaret is asking, uh, are there more studies showing changes in other organisms like fish or bird populations that live in or near the lake, um, perhaps that relate to climate change um, or have other organizations seen changes after storm events? I'm um, just wondering about more birds of prey or different fish catch. Uh, that sounds like a fun study. <laughs> it does sound like a fun study. And, and uh, you know, I, there, there are a lot of people working on similar things, uh, in particular at the University of Vermont, and actually Sea Grant is funding some some similar things. One of the difficulties about biology, um, and you know how well an organism can thrive or not thrive, um, is that as I mentioned earlier, Lake Champlain is going through more than just one stress, right? It's going through not only kind of the, the pollution, the, the climate change, but also the storm, you know, the, the pollution where um, all the phosphorus that goes in the lake from New York and Vermont. Um, stormwater going in, taking all of those things with it. Um, and so that can cause, you know, algae blooms and all those things. Um, it's also experiencing invasive species. And so as, you know, the um, spiny water flea and the fish hook water, uh, fish, fish hook, uh, water flea come in, um, and the zebra mussels did, uh, you know, what, a decade ago now, um, when those things move in, they also influence the biology and the food chain. Um, and so I think, um, you know, there's the potential for climate change to influence some of the larger species, um, in particular, uh, uh, you know, lake trout, like a, like a little bit colder, but, um, you know, it's, 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 it's a little bit tricky in order to uh, test whether or not that's actually happening because of all of these other things that are happening at the same time. So, um, and I will say that, um, um, there is a group at, at University of Vermont, so Ellen Marsden and a couple of her students are trying to track uh, fish and see if they move uh, kind of north-south um, with the sloshing of the lake following windstorms. So people are definitely um, uh, working on this. Um, I don't think we have an answer yet, though. And I will say, before Nate uh, jumps back in, I will say, if anyone has any further questions, always feel free to email. Uh, I'd be happy to respond, too. That's great. Thanks, Eric. Um, yeah, so we have Eric's email uh, up on the screen right now, and uh, I believe Ashley uh, dropped that email link in the chat box as well. So if you want to take down uh, that email address and uh, send Eric a question directly, we also have some resources uh, that we're going to plug in just a moment um, that hopefully will help answer some of your questions. Uh, I'm going to share my screen again, and uh, we're going to move uh, quickly through these last couple slides. So you should see one more poll pop up on your screen in just a second. Uh, and that's a feedback poll, uh, just to let us know how we did and sort of for you to rate today's presentation. Uh, and if you would fill that out, we'd greatly appreciate it. Uh, helps us figure out what we're doing well, what we can improve on. Um, if you're not seeing this poll pop up, you can type any general feedback you have in the chat box. Uh, if you're joining us on YouTube, uh, you can go ahead and type that feedback directly into the chat feature there. Um, that would be great. So we'll let this poll run for a couple of minutes. Uh, there's a few questions here folks can go through. And then once you're done, I have a, a take home activity to share with you all. So just take a minute to fill out this poll if you would. And while folks are filling out the poll, I'll just offer, I have captured the questions that were lingering in the chat box. There were some really great ones. Um, Eric's talk was so inspiring and there's actually a comment in here about where are the, the Greta's for Lake Champlain. Um, and so hopefully maybe this talk will have inspired some, but we'll be sure to convene with Eric and share some of these questions. And maybe we can send a follow-up email that has the answer. Cause I think there's some really great questions in here um, that probably provide a, a uh, great insight to the, the talk further. So we'll be sure to follow up with those. I had a Greta slide, I took it out. <laughs> <laughs> Next time. Next time. <laughs> yeah.
Uh, great. So I'll just let this poll run for a few more seconds uh, and then I'll end it so we can get folks out of here, hopefully right at one o'clock. Um, but I appreciate you all sticking around. Um, looks like almost everyone has filled out this feedback poll. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and end it. Thank you so much um, for giving us that feedback. Really appreciate it. Um, and we're going to move forward here. So a quick take home activity um, from myself. So I would love it if you all could plan a courageous conversation about climate change. So, uh, you know, don't have the conversation if you don't feel comfortable, but it's, uh, I think, a powerful exercise to imagine that conversation and maybe make a journal entry or write this out as a story. Uh, think about what you might share, sort of maybe it's this experience or maybe it's what you felt the first time you heard about climate change and heard about the impacts projected. Uh, would you share data? Uh, would you talk about how it's impacted you personally? Um, how maybe it has impacted people you know or people you don't know? Uh, again, maybe you want to imagine your vision for the future. So, uh, you know, it's 25, 30, 40, 50 years from now, and we've uh, more or less uh, solved the climate crisis, or at least are moving in the, in the right direction, and you want to talk about uh, your vision for that. Um, if you want to share those with us, we have our Instagram handle, and uh, we're also on Facebook, so you can share those with us if you would like. Um, Ashley will be dropping a bunch of links right now in the chat box. One of them is to the Lake Champlain Basin Program and some of the information and projections that they've compiled about climate change here in the basin. Uh, also, there's a link to the long-term monitoring project that uh, Eric spoke about in his presentation. Tons of data in there uh, to sift through if you're interested on any of the tributaries or the lake itself. Uh, also, the link to Eric's uh, data buoys, once those are back up and running, I got to launch them with Eric uh, last spring, so hoping to uh, get that experience again, uh, maybe early this summer, uh, if we're able to. And then I put one uh, final link, it's a, a web comic uh, that I love that talks about the last 22,000 years uh, of climate history. Uh, that's really fun to, to go through and, and provides a nice visual of, of climate change. Uh, over you know uh, tens of thousands of years scale, and then the last uh, hundred years or uh, hundred plus years of anthropogenic climate change. So, uh, with that, uh, I'd just like to invite you to our next Zoom of Scientist series uh, on Tuesday, April twenty first at noon. Uh, we're going to be joined uh, on a conversation about uh, a fish's story. So, following lake trout movement around Lake Champlain. Uh, so this is researchers from the University of Vermont studying aquatic organisms. Uh, aquatic organisms